Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ram. Uh, uh, many of us already uh, know Ram through his uh, wonderful work in vision and language, as well as uh, explainable computer vision. We've all used uh, uh, Ram's uh, famous work like GradCam before. And so it's really an honor to have Ram present uh, uh, at AI2 today. Um, um, Ram graduated with a uh, PhD from Georgia Tech. Um, he was a scientist at uh, Salesforce Research, and now he's a scientist at Artera AI. Uh, welcome, Ram. We're, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Ani. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank everyone for taking the time to attend uh, my talk. Um, so, um, like Ani said, uh, we're going to today talk about uh, how we can empower human-like decision making in AI models through explanations. Um, let's get started. Uh, we are getting closer towards having fully autonomous systems which can transport us to work every day. But when these systems fail, they fail spectacularly disgracefully, leaving an end user uh, staring at an incoherent output, wondering why the model did what it did. And uh, we seem to be living in a world where machine learning based mistakes gain far more attention than human errors. Um, and as these machines get more and more advanced, uh, they will be likely increasingly assisting doctors in performing surgeries. Um, however, if a model suggests uh, a course of action that deviates from what is standard practice, it will be difficult to know uh, if following that suggestion could lead to a catastrophic failure or if it could lead to a new breakthrough that we haven't explored yet. Uh, to build trust in AI models and meaningfully integrate them into our uh, everyday lives, uh, it is clear that uh, interpretability is crucial. And uh, this involves building transparent models or techniques that can explain their predictions to us. Um, I think that um, you know this transparency and the ability to explain is useful at three different stages of AI evolution. Uh, first, when an AI is significantly weaker than humans and not readily deployable, the explanations could help identify the failure modes and thereby help researchers focus their efforts on the most fruitful research directions. Second, when an AI is on par with humans and uh, even readily deployable, explanations could help uh, establish appropriate trust and confidence in end users. Uh, in this stage, um, like in the third stage, when an AI is significantly stronger than humans, uh, the explanations can even facilitate machine teaching, where machines teach humans how to make better decisions. Um, in this talk, I'll first discuss my earlier work on explaining decisions made by deep learning models. And um, uh, this is going to provide a uh, foundation for the rest of my uh, work and the talk. Um, I'll then explore how the insights gained from these explanations can help us identify and mitigate any biases that might be learned by these models. Following that, I'll talk about how explanations can serve as a tool to transfer human knowledge and uh, try to make models reason similar to us humans. Um, and finally, discuss uh, what I think is uh, next, some future directions that I'm excited um, as you can see in the first part, I'll be talking about explaining uh, model decisions. And in the second and third part, I'll be talking about how these explanations can fix various characteristics of the model. Uh, coming to the first part, uh, we're trying to visualize explanations from uh, deep networks, specifically vision-based models. Uh, to this end, we introduce GradCam. Let me briefly introduce GradCam. Um, so given an image, we feed it through the convolutional layers of CNN. Um, the output of this are, you know, feature um, activation maps. And these can be used for any task. Uh, for example, let's take, uh, you know, image classification, where you have a couple of fully connected layers followed by a final 
uh, softmax uh, and your model let's say predicts tiger cat now we want to understand why did the model say tiger cat in order to do this we first determine what are the most important neurons in the last convolutional layer essentially a layer that's known to be more uh, looking at uh, human like features um now can we determine what uh, how important uh, different neurons are for this particular class to do this we compute the gradients um, essentially uh, compute uh, the gradients until the last convolutional layer for this logit and this gives us gradient maps that are of the same dimension as the um, input feature activation maps um, we are trying to determine like at a neural level how important they are so we do a global average pulling and because we want to explain this particular image we can combine it combine each of these weights with the uh, corresponding uh, forward activation map and uh, uh, remove the negative values to get uh, a 2d heat map and this heat map um, in our red highlights regions that are most uh, are the model plays most attention to and uh, blue indicates regions that the model things are not important and uh, here this note that this is of the same dimension as your last convolutional layer um, but you can you know um, extrapolate it to your image size and you know visualize it on top of the image um we can also do this for other tasks like image captioning where you might have an lstm that predicts um a cat laying on the ground or have models that have additional input modalities like vqa is there a cat and you can visualize the answers uh essentially all we're doing is computing gradients all the way from the you know your final decision layer to the uh, convolutional layer so um, all the requirement here is that just the network should be differentiable and which is the case for the most all networks that we train um we can combine this with a uh, guided backdrop to get much more you know clear uh, visualization at a pixel level what is important here this visualization might highlight that uh, it's not just a cat it's a tiger cat and most important things here are, um, might correspond to the um, uh, like the stripes uh, you can do this for classes that the model did not predict here this image also has uh, a boxer a dog category now we can you know determine um where the model is looking at um so we can use these insights uh for various things um you know one of the first things that we found quite interesting is uh, to analyze um failure modes of networks uh, for this image um the model incorrectly predicted this to be a car mirror uh just looking at the prediction it might not be clear why the model might have said that but if you look at the explanation this just seems to be highlighting the edges indicating that uh, you know making this uh, looking at this explanation might make me uh, not feel not so bad um and here um, of course it can also highlight uh, the, for the ground truth category volcano where is the model looking at um here this model predicted this to be a wine snake um and uh, if you look at the explanation it does seem to you know look um, a little bit like a wine snake at least a part of a wine snake and uh, of course it can, and if you're trying to visualize the whole uh, the class coil it looks at the entirety of the coil um so it's interesting to know that even unreasonable predictions sometime can have reasonable explanations uh people have extended this for videos um here you can see um you know for the class uncovering something uh the model seems to be paying attention to like regions that can be uncovered um and here uh, you can see for the class pushing as the person's hand uh comes closer to the multimeter you can see the edges getting highlighted um over the last year at my startup um among other things have been exploring how explanations can help predict patient outcomes and you know convince doctors that uh, uh models are reasonable 
Um, so now let's look at uh, GradCam for some pre-training tasks. Um, pre-training is super popular these days. Uh, let's look at how GradCam can uh, you know, help us understand what models are doing. So within the language pre-training, you know, um, aims to learn multimodal representations from image text pairs um, and uh, then goal is to improve some uh, downstream tasks. Uh, one popular pre-training strategy that was introduced include a clip. Um, this is a model designed to map images and their corresponding textual descriptions into the same latent space. Um, and uh, in this latent space, they can be compared and matched. However, this has some serious limitations, uh, which include the requirement of large number of negatives uh, for every example. Um, and this is achieved by using large memory uh, banks, or, you know, large batch sizes. Um, and of course, they need large scale pre training data sets. Uh, for example, Clip uses about 400 million image text pairs. So we introduce um, an approach called Clip Lite. Um, uh, so essentially, we present um, an efficient uh, Jensen Shannon divergence based objective that can be op optimized with just one negative example uh, for every positive example. Uh, so essentially, we encode the image, uh, its positive caption, and one negative caption, pass the positive and the negative caption pairs through uh, mutual information uh, discriminator to get a score for each pair. And we can estimate and maximize the JSP-based um, uh, mutual information using a contrast of a objective. And uh, this can be done with just one random negative example. And uh, as compared to CLIP, you can see for each example, you might need uh, a lot of negatives. Um, but uh, in our case, you can just use like just one. Essentially, in your batch, you can just you know, shuffle and just have one of those shuffles as your negative. Um, so, uh, as such, we extend this to you know lower data regimes and lower resource regimes, and show that you know Clip Light, when trained with just twenty percent of Coco dataset, already outperforms Clip trained on the whole of Coco. Uh, we extended uh, GradCam to this free training setting, and we can see how uh, uh, the model can even ground uh, action phrases such as bending over uh, in the bottom left, left image uh, for, the, uh, for the concept blue. And it seems to highlight all the blue regions of the man's shirt, uh, man's clothes. And uh, interestingly, it also understands the concept of blurry player, where it focuses on the background. Um, so now let's take uh, a step forward and extend this to transformer-based architectures. Uh, Ram, quick question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, your clip light work, uh, do you mind going back another slide, uh, maybe one more? Yep. Yeah. I see. So, so you mentioned that clip. One of the limitations of clip is that it requires very large number of negatives, right? basically large batch sizes. But clip light requires just one negative, right? So, but it seems to me that uh, is can this negative be a truly random negative from? So let's say if clip is pre-trained on I don't know conceptual captions or YFCC or something. Can we have such a weak single negative and it work well, or do you need a hard negative? Oh, actually, we just experimented with a simple negative here, and that seemed to uh, work just as well. Um, we haven't experimented with you know hard negatives in this work. Um, in the future work that uh, I'll be talking about, yeah, we introduced uh, you know hard negative mining, uh, but. Uh, we haven't uh, done any such experiments here. I see. And then uh, a second uh, follow-up question on this work was that, uh, so you mentioned an interesting result. You said with 20% of the data on Coco Captions, you're able to um, 
I guess, outperform 100% of the data when using the original clip objective? Uh, yes, on this particular data set, like on Coco, right. so SSP clip uh, seems to be doing well because of its, uh, you know, large batch size and the large data sets that are required. Right. Um, so what happens here is if you, you know, try to uh, get clip to work for, you know, lower data, data regimes, we don't see as good uh, performance gains. I see. Um, if you, if you, so lower data regimes are very interesting, but how how do you think clip light would work if you had 10x the amount of data as code coco has great question, great question. yeah uh, one thing that we have uh, uh, noticed is that clip light uh, the jsd based objective you know works good only in the regimes where there is very less data and um, like you know we have been trying to determine at what point is um, you know just clip sufficient in the sense that you don't need these kind of um, approaches that um, can just deal with lower data, uh, and we we believe that uh, you know even if you you know make the data set size just ten x larger, uh, clip might be outperforming clip light. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so now let's take uh, a step forward and extend this to transformer-based architectures. Um, a typical uh, multimodal transformer-based vision language pre-training method uh, might look like this. Uh, they rely on pre-trained uh, ob object detectors uh, to extract region-based uh, image features and concatenate with token-based word embedders and uh, feed them through a multimodal encoder diffuse the image and text features. Uh, and they use downstream tasks that involve uh, joint understanding of both images and text, such as uh, image text matching or masked language modeling. Um, but they do have some limitations. Uh, one of those might include um, that these image features and the uh, word token embeddings might reside in their own spaces uh, which might make it really challenging for the multimodal encoder to you know, model their interactions. Um, and this object detector um, is both annotation expensive and quite compute expensive as well. And uh, because you tend to use large scale uh, 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 data sets that are from the web, uh, they might be inherently noisy. So existing pre-training objective might you know, overfit to the noisy text and degrade model performance. Uh, to this end, we introduced an approach, uh, ALBEF, um, which is a new vision language retraining framework that addresses these uh, three limitations. Uh, we first encode the image and text independently through a detector-free uh, encoder and a text encoder, and here, the image encoder is a vision transformer, and the text encoder is just the first six layers of BERT. And then we used a multimodal encoder um, to fuse the image features with the text features through cross-modal attention. And in, for this multimodal encoder, the, we, used, we just used the last six layers of BERT. And we introduced an image text contrastive loss and this learns to model, um, uh, this learns unimodal encoders that better capture the semantic meaning of the image and text. And this could make the multimodal encoder learn, uh, you know, image and text interactions uh, better. And we train this uh, through a momentum model uh, because, uh, you know, there might be images uh, that might contain things not mentioned by the text or the text might contain words that are unrelated to the image. So uh, using a momentum model um, uh, with an exponential moving average of your previous model helps uh, you train these models uh, in the noisy setting better. And um, you know we, we pre-trained ALBEF on a combination of uh, human annotated and uh, web leak raw data sets, and we evaluated on 
multiple downstream tasks and find that ALBEF achieves state-of-the-art results. Um, and in some cases, even outperforming approaches that are trained on uh, you know, orders of magnitude larger data sets. Um, and uh, you know, we can visualize both the unimodal embedding layers that are trained through this uh, image text contrastive loss. And uh, here are some examples. Um, if you're a man with the head down, you're trying to visualize you know, where the model is looking at, and you can see the attention focuses right at the man. A girl with a black tank, again, a green shirt. Um, we can now even go a step further and visualize uh, the multimodal uh, attention, uh, the cross-model attention layers. And um, like we can also visualize attentions for individual tokens. Here we see that for the caption, a little girl holding a kitten next to a blue fence. We see the attention for the girl looking at the girl's face. Uh, for holding, it seems to be looking at the regions where the um, girl's hand touches um, the kitten. And uh, of course, for kitten, it focuses on the kitten. And more interestingly, for the word next, it already seems to be attending to the regions around uh, the girl. And um, again, you can do this for VQA. Uh, is this a rice noodle soup? Uh, you can see it focusing on the noodles and more interestingly, the uh, parts of the noodles which contain the rice. And uh, what is to the right of the soup? It seems to be looking quite a bit at the chopsticks um, when answering chopsticks. And uh, what is a man doing in the street? Walking, and more interestingly, it seems to be looking at the leg of the person. And uh, you no, know, for the question, what does the truck on the left sell? It says uh, ice cream and looks at the truck. Um, so it's interesting to see that you know GradCam can provide visual explanations even for complex uh, attention-based models. Um, so what have we extracted from explanations so far? Um, we have found a way to establish trust in users, and I've also you know identified some failure modes for current models. Um, I think you know coming back to the three stages of AI evolution. Um, I wanted to see, you know, in the first space um, where an AI performs significantly worse than a human, how can explanations help improve uh, various aspects of the model? So now um, let's move to that. Um, until now, we only use like, interpretability to establish trust and uh, understand failures. I wanted to see if we can do something more. And uh, more specifically, we wanted to see, uh, can we use this as a tool to understand the biases that are learned by these models and uh, find ways to mitigate them? Um, so one of the work that we did along this space is to ground um, the self-supervised representations that are learned by these models. Um, in this paper cast, um, we introduced, um, you know, first uh, inter let's introduce contrastive self-supervised learning. It learns to, uh, it, it, the task is to learn visual representation from unlabeled images through instance discrimination. Some, uh, you know, recent methods have uh, begun to outperform fully supervised image net retraining on several tasks. Um, unfortunately, their success has been confined to unlabeled ImageNet images only. And a naive application of these approaches to uncurated web images has only shown marginal gains. Um, in this work, we analyze the contrast of SSL approaches to understand the cause of these limitations, uh, where a naive application of them to a complex uh, scene level or web scale data, uh, data sets only shows minor improvements. Uh, first thing, we find them to have poor visual grounding ability. In this example, um, if you take uh, uh, the two crops, uh, 
and uh, try to visualize uh, GradCam to understand which regions the model relies on when matching the query and the key. Uh, the model seems to be looking more at the grass regions uh, than that of the dog. And um, this leads us to realize that uh, these models might be relying on lower level visual cues or spurious background correlations. Um, like even during crop computation stage, uh, taking random crops from an image may be acceptable for iconic images, but for scene level images such as this, they might receive imperfect supervisory signals when these augmented views contain you know, different visual concepts, uh, discouraging uh, semantic understanding. And we think that you know, uh, these two issues might explain the, uh, the reason for diminishing improvements of contrastive SSL models when trained on you know, uh, complex scene level images. Um, to this end, we, uh, to fix this, our first contribution is a semantic alternative to random cropping, uh, where we devise an intelligent um, geometric transform for cropping different views of an Im input image um, with an unsupervised saliency map. And we introduce uh, area-based constraints. And uh, so this essentially leaves uh, us with you know, two crops that have a salient region that is common between them. And uh, we also can get crop-oriented saliency maps, uh, which can be you know, used for supervision. Uh, let's get to our approach cast, uh, contrastive attention supervised tuning. Um, we are going to be talking about this in the context of MoCo. And the idea is um, quite simple to just encourage models to rely on appropriate salient regions during the contrastive retraining stage. Uh, we show, um, like, given an image and its saliency map. Uh, from an, an unsupervised approach called deep USPS. Um, like through the uh, saliency constraint cropping strategy, we get a query and a key crop along with uh, crop oriented saliency maps. Um, and uh, we pass the query and the key to their respective encoders. Um, the momentum contrastive loss here. Um, tries to take the query and the key representation uh, and make them closer, uh, but further away from a queue of negatives. With the mask key containing just the salient uh, region of the key crop, we can then compute the gradient of the dot product of the query and the mask key representation uh, with respect to the last convolutional layer of the query encoder. And uh, we can gl global average pool these gradients and combine them with the forward activation maps to compute uh, GradCam. And this represents the regions uh, in the query that the model looks to match the representation of the two um, uh, representations uh, uh, of the query and the key. As you can see, the model seems to be looking more at the background regions and not uh, the shape as we would have liked. Uh, Hence, we provide a cosine similarity based uh, attention loss to align the GradCam map with the query aligned saliency map. Uh, these two losses are combined to form our cast loss. And uh, the model upon convergence, uh, you know, now seems to be relying more on the sheep when matching the two representations. Like, um, so coming to the results. Um, we find CAS to be uh, to outperform all baselines by a huge margin, and uh, more interestingly, we find that uh, you know when we pre-train CAS on Coco, a 10x smaller data set than ImageNet, it even outperforms uh, ImageNet fully supervised pre-training on the on the fine-tuning task. Um, we also find this improved grounding during pre-training stage transfers to downstream tasks as well. Note how the ImageNet fully supervised model and the MoCo baseline seems to be looking at the background as well to predict ball player 
whereas task pre-trained model only looks at the player. We also find that uh, cast models attend to the whole extent of objects. Um, I know to test uh, the model's robustness, um, we evaluated on um, a background challenge data set where the backgrounds of ImageNet images are replaced with various settings. And as can be seen, um, like cast free trained models significantly outperform on all these settings. And uh, here's an example when you feed an image of a bird and uh, now change the background to uh, go from sky to water, the baseline model changes its prediction to fish, whereas a cast free trained model still predicts bird. Uh, and this indicates the model's reliance on uh, foreground regions more. And similarly, when the background of this reptile class is changed to a place where musical instruments typically occur, um, the model, uh, the cast free train model still uh, predicts, um, you know, a reptile. Uh, this indicates that, you know, cast makes models resistant to background changes. Uh, we also introduced uh, uh, an extension uh, for videos, and we find uh, this problem to be even more prevalent in case of videos where you know backgrounds can mostly remain the same. And uh, so, when you try to temporal, uh, when you try to associate these frames temporally, uh, they might learn inconsistent semantics. And again, uh, grounding might be a problem where the model can just get away by just looking at the background regions. Uh, we wanted to see um, how can we, you know, better, um, how can we get better uh, positive and uh, foreground sample, um, foreground focused samples uh, during the pre-training stage. And to this, we used uh, an unsupervised tracking approach and uh, essentially designed uh, a sampling strategy that utilizes unsupervised foreground tracking uh, and introduced um, you know, spatial and uh, temporal constraints um, and essentially tried to supervise our models um, to rely more on the object of interest when giving out any explanations. Um, like, we find that you know grounded representations you know help improve downstream performance, including achieving achieving state of the art uh, compared to you know previous uh, approaches that use uh, the same um, visual backbone. Um, we can now evaluate our models on you know we can also perform unsupervised tracking where you just uh, give the model uh, the first frame and the object that you uh, that you want to track and then uh, see where the model is looking at. Uh, and you can see that, uh, you know, privates can localize models, uh, more localized objects, even uh, when the uh, viewpoint has changed considerably uh, since the first frame. And uh, we can see uh, through this example, um, how uh, our baseline is doing, where it's you know not relying on the person of interest, but uh, for the class snowboard here, uh, the model seems to be you know focusing quite a bit on the person performing the trick. So uh, now uh, we've added another uh, interesting capability through explanations. Uh, which is to ground explanations, uh, sorry, ground representations from these uh, self-supervised models. Um, so, so far, we talked about how explanations uh, from deep networks uh, can help us understand when models are biased. Um, now we wanted to see if we can move towards making um, these models more human-like um, and uh, to this end, we uh, tried to, you know, provide explanations um, 
to provide targeted human feedback. Uh, Ram, quick question. Yes. So your uh, previous work that you just presented was very interesting. So you've basically like a sort of a higher bit that I took from it was that grad cam can give you um, sort of a can allow you to sort of do uh, to create more grounded representations, which brings up the idea that when you train, and I, and I know that the work that you're presenting was sort of, uh, you know, maybe 18 months ago or so, just about when CLIP started coming in. But I was wondering, can GradCam be used to provide weak supervision so that when you're doing this contrastive pre-training like CLIP, you can actually not just get representations, but also full image segmentation, maybe? Like yeah, yeah, like on data sets where you have um where you have grounding, um we can essentially estimate where the model is looking at and provide that as an additional supervision. Certainly. Uh, in fact, one of the work that I'm going to be talking about in this section. Uh, this is again not in the uh, pre-training stage, but uh, we're trying to see if models can benefit from even tiny amount of supervision, uh, grounded supervision. Um, certainly, I think there is a lot of scope for uh, you know improving uh, current models through uh, you know adding grounding. I see. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward. Thanks. In the first work, we wanted to see how explanations can provide a targeted human feedback. Uh, this was a work uh, called Taking a Hint, Leveraging Explanations to Improve Grounding. Um, so as many of you might be aware, uh, we know that models, uh, visual language models, have the problem of using statistical correlations in the training data to arrive at decisions. Um, like this is uh, this problem might be you know less hap happening less now, but this was certainly the case uh, earlier, where models might just predict uh, a caption like a giraffe standing next to a tree, and uh, you can understand that this model might have just seen you know giraffes uh, next to trees during training. Most of the images having uh, trees next to a giraffe. Um, and uh, again, for VQA, uh, we had models struggling with uh, getting the color of bananas. Um, and this is going to be a problem uh, because you know you can always you know go back uh, to your training data and balance uh, and create you know balanced data sets. But after uh, after you balance them. There is nothing that uh, that is stopping these models from learning a new kind of bias. So when uh, you know distributions change during test times, this is even more prevalent. Um, so uh, we in this way we try to utilize where humans look at when making decisions. So this uh, data set uh, was collected um, by uh, folks from my lab, uh, where uh, for a small subset of the VQA dataset, they um, you know, blurred the image and asked people um, a question, and they had to unblur the regions and uh, give an answer. Um, so we introduced an approach called HINT, um, Human Importance Aware Network Tuning, where we essentially took uh, an existing uh, VQA approach and just added grounding. Um, so essentially, we tried to align the model's explanations for the ground truth category with human attention maps. And uh, what this gave us was about a 7% uh, improvements on uh, VQA CP. And um, more interestingly, and uh, note that this is just with uh, this additional supervision given on 6% of your VQA data set. And uh, you can see 
an interesting thing where if you just provide one one and a half percent of supervision, you already get about a five percent uh, five percent improvement. And uh, this shows that uh, you know when you make um, these machines look at regions uh, similar to humans, uh, they can help uh, generalize to you know new unseen distributions better. Uh, we also you know, applied this for image captioning models uh, and you know saw that uh, we can improve model grounding ability by quite a bit. Like here, the model might be always looking at the sink to say toothbrush, but now it uh, localizes the toothbrush quite well. And similarly, a woman with a tennis racket with a cat in the air, uh, it seems to be you know looking at the uh, cat. So um, now we uh, and we now have a way to provide you know targeted human feedback uh, through the use of these explanations. Um, these explanations can we can now use these explanations to make models reason compositionally. Um, this was a work called squinting at VKO models. Um, we designed VKO models. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. There's a question from Chris. Yeah, yes, certainly. Uh, okay, I was just wanted to ask about the the work you were just mentioning. So I think if you showed me that work, yep, I'd had some concern the model will somehow learn a set of weights that satisfies the uh, region matching boss, but still kind of sneakily uses the bias on the side in a way that kind of circumvents the loss and i wonder if you think that's happening to some extent and i know there are some bqacp models that uh get a higher score than the one showed here so i wonder if you think there's still a bit of bias kind of slipping through uh certainly. through that yeah certainly it could be happening um this is the difference between um like let me show this particular one here um, so in the middle, uh, you see, um, you know, when you try to supervise with just attention, so attention is computed in a feed forward way. I feel like the problem that you just described is more uh, prevalent in cases where attention, uh, in, in cases where you are using feed forward attention, because the model can, uh, like the later layers of the model that are after this attention layer can you know just uh, ignore all the uh, all the things that are uh, attended by the image and then utilize the language biases and do this but when you use a grad cam based alignment instead of attention alignment what this does is you are uh, essentially using the layers of the network that are responsible for the decision. Essentially, you are trying to use the uh, weights of the network that go from the attention layer to the final prediction. So essentially, those uh, explanations are much more faithful to the model, which makes these models learn less bias. Um, certainly, it's yeah. still possible, but we just tried to mitigate this by doing these alignments in the grad cam space rather than the attention space. Uh, yeah, I see. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, so um, like in BQA models, uh, if you ask a question, is the banana ripe enough to eat? The model might say yes, but uh, if you ask a question about uh, the color of the banana, it might uh, it might answer you know that it's a green banana. So you're like, oh wait, if it didn't clearly understand the color, how did it get a more complex question involving the ripeness? Correct. Um, so to understand the extent of this happening, we collected a VQ introspect data set showing humans uh, an image and a question that requires reasoning and ask them to provide perception-based question answer pairs that are helpful for answering the main reasoning question. For example, here is this a keepsake photo 
people tend to ask about uh, the woman wearing a white veil. Uh, here is the giraffe at the zoo. People tend to talk about the existence of, uh, you know, a fence around it. Here, uh, does this appear to be an emergency? People talk about all the cars that are gathered um, and a fire truck and ambulance. And uh, is this a good idea for the rainy day? People talk about the existence of a, a roof. So we wanted to, you know, understand, you know, how consistent our VKA models are. And uh, we found that uh, some of the earlier models were, uh, you know, they were uh, right for the wrong reasons about 28% of the times. Uh, we proposed an approach called squint uh, that essentially aligns explanations for these, uh, for the main question with that of the sub question. And um, we tried to, you know, make these models reason better. Uh, and uh, here is an example. Uh, is the clock in America? The model said yes. Uh, uh, like for the answer, yes. Um, uh, like a baseline model said no, and it was looking at the clock. Um, but if you ask a sub question, is there an American flag? Um, the model says yes. Now, in squinted models, if you made these models use the sub question uh, to answer the main question, essentially you're making these models look at the uh, American flag to answer the question about uh, whether the clock is in America. Yeah. Uh, so also at NACL, we introduced uh, a concept of, you know, relevant sub questions and irrelevant sub questions for answering the main reasoning question and introduced a contrast of gradient based loss to make these models more consistent. Um, yeah, so another uh, thing that we added here is uh, use explanations to help models reason compositionally, getting them similar to how humans make uh, decisions. Um, now, we also you know, did some work on you know, uh, incorporating human domain knowledge into networks. So we looked at how um, explanations can serve as a medium to incorporate human domain knowledge in the form of natural language uh, to extend a classifier to detect new classes. And um, so here, essentially, if a human uh, expert uh, talks about a new class, we align it uh, with what the network has already learned and make these networks learn uh, new classes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have uh, started some work on you know incorporating human domain knowledge through natural language uh, through these explanations. Uh, people have also used uh, uh, GradCam to, you know, uh, mitigate gender bias. This is work done by, you know, Kelly Burns and Lisa Hendricks, where they sh uh, where they saw that uh, models sometimes can um, give the wrong prediction with wrong evidence. Essentially, the model might predict this image to have a man sitting at a desk with a laptop computer. And interestingly, not only it gets the gender wrong, it also looks at the computer to when it is saying man. Uh, in some cases, it might correctly predict the gender, but it might be looking at the wrong regions. Uh, like when, for the class, uh, for the word man, the model seems to be looking at the tennis racket. So they introduced uh, a loss um, that's called a model called equalizer, essentially to perform or to make models, you know, uh, be right for the right reasons. Um, there's been work that uh, used GradCam to reduce catastrophic forgetting. So in continual learning settings, they showed that in addition to remembering the prediction that the model made. If you also remember um, and recollect the reason for the prediction, they tend to forget less. And they showed that if you, uh, if the model, you know, tries to recollect uh, where the model looked through GradCam, they can see a consistent improvement in performance. 
So yeah, here's another one uh, to you know uh, reduce unwanted biases that the network has learned. Um, so recent work from University of Washington introduced a pasture benchmark uh, for language-driven zero-shot object navigation, which is built on top of RoboThought. Uh, for the models that they considered, uh, they checked to see if a uh, grad cam focuses on the object when it explores the scene. Uh, note that in this case, all this is still post-doc. Uh, basically, you train models and then see where the model is looking. But there is scope for training models to explicitly look at objects when navigating. And this could uh, you know, help uh, these models be much more robust. And uh, you know, some uh, research has extended this to even actor perception tasks, where real robots are navigating on real scenarios, where they try to answer the question, you know, um, how do different sensors of the uh, agents, uh, how are they used, and when does the model rely on visual observations? When does it rely on, uh, you know, uh, and where, where does it, what regions does it attend to? And they notice that you know uh, models tend to look at obstacles that are on the way, and ignore the same obstacles when they're visible, but they're not hindering its navigation towards the target location. They also find that you know models uh, look at uh, you know the visual input when it considers uh, direction change, you know looking at the direction you know throughout the whole turn. So we started, we you know started you know GradCam for uh, yeah, applied it to static images. It's exciting to see how it's you know being applied to tasks that involve you know even uh, active perception. So yeah, and now we have uh, also seen some work that uh, use GradCam and these explanations to understand how robots do in real life scenarios. Um, so, so far we've looked at how explanations can help, uh, uh, how we can get explanations and how explanations can help vary, uh, help improve various characteristics of the model. I also want to touch a little bit on, you know, some interesting research directions uh, to see where else can explainability help. Um, so, as you know, I know Chat GPT has took the research world and even elsewhere by surprise. Uh, however, some of its failure modes have raised a lot of concerns. And uh, this concern can be linked to hallucination, where its answers are not very well grounded. Essentially, they just, just retrieve stuff approximately or just in some cases even make stuff up. Um, you know, I wanted to see how can generative AI and explainable AI, you know, work together to solve this issue. I see two regimes here, uh, one where explanations can ground these uh, generative models. I know uh, we've seen that, you know, these large attention models might be encoding training data in their weights. And uh, for any input, can we explain it based on uh, the weights? and thereby track what is the training data that was used uh, to learn these weights and how the model composed it all. And uh, in another regime, going the, uh, the slightly different way, can LLMs be used uh, to make any model explainable? LLMs or any generative uh, model. Um, these models learn from so much data and they learn to understand complex patterns and relationships between uh, that exist within the data. Can we use them to analyze the weights of a model? So essentially, you know, can you input uh, model parameters through an LLM and you know, get uh, a natural language explanation for how the model is doing? And uh, can we extend it further to you know, use a language as a medium to provide more feedback to these uh, models. So essentially, um, I'm looking, I'm quite excited by this, uh, by, you know, factual, uh, by getting 
uh, factual and controllable AI through explanations. And I believe that uh, there is a lot of ways where uh, explainability can make uh, you know models much more factual and more in, uh, importantly, you know, controllable. So we can you know uh, play with these models better and align it to our use cases. Um, so far, we've you know been looking at uh, fixing networks through the use of examples. Uh, you know, can we abstract it out and you know? Uh, move in favor of higher level rules uh, that can guide uh, the decision making. Like, you know, these higher level rules can be, you know, abstract concepts that might be capturing, you know, human knowledge or principles. So overall, I mean, uh, an example of this can be, you know, uh, in the fairness side, uh, can we just provide a rule saying, you know, make sure that the model does not discriminate against uh, a particular population. Uh, make sure that you know any decision that the model makes does not pose uh, any risk to human safety. So I think you know by making you know machine learning models much more human centric, we can create models that are you know better suited to work alongside humans and perform tasks that align with human preferences, uh, expectations, or even principles that we have. Um, we, you know, what else can we do with explanations? So we have seen how explanation can improve uh, certain aspects of models. But we are already seeing uh, models that far surpass human capabilities. An interesting question now is, you know, can we use explanations to help us get us better at our tasks? Um, yeah, that's an open question. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, in case there is uh, not much time left and you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and we can set up uh, meetings or even just uh, answer offline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ram. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we, are, we probably have time for one question. Uh, I'd like to prioritize people who don't have one-on-ones already set up with you. So, uh, are there any questions? Please uh, feel free to ask them now. Okay. In in, in that case, we are uh, uh, exactly at eleven o'clock. So, uh, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, and uh, Ram, many of us have the opportunity to meet you today uh, on one-on-one. -on -one, so looking forward to those conversations. Yep. Thank you so much, Annie. Looking forward to it. Thanks again, everyone. See you. Bye.